Gail, please tell me what is the preferred way to pronounce your name? I feel like in Spanish, I would love if everyone could just say Gael, just how mm-hmm. it is. But of course, like in, just in the U.S., I'm always like, okay, my name is Gael, Gael A. Gael, yeah. Gael. Welcome to New Here, honest conversations and practical advice to help you play the game called work. I'm Eleni Mata. This week, we're going to look at networking, specifically when you're starting from scratch and need to make all those awkward first reach outs and introductions. Wait, so now I'm curious, what's everyone's full name pronunciation in Spanish? Mine is Elaine Mata. Interesting. I'm just Gael Aitor. Aitor? Mm-hmm, Aitor. Nice. Yeah, Gael Aitor. And I, I'm Eric Jonathan <laughs> Rodriguez. My parents wanted me to fit in so fast <laughs> in the 80s. <laughs> but you say like, como Eric. Sí, sí, me dicen Eric. Eric. Yeah, me dicen Eric. You might not buy into the idea that networking matters, or you might think that it'll always feel fake and inauthentic. You might even think, I have LinkedIn, isn't that enough? One thing I've learned is that networking is more about finding ways to support other people and building real relationships. And those relationships can help you in the future, even if you can't see it right now. Reframing networking this way has also helped me get over some of the awkward first interactions that a lot of us dread. Another thing that's helped me is thinking about building a professional network in the same way that I build friendships. Today, we'll explore different ways to start these relationships in a way that feels authentic. And we'll learn how to sustain those relationships over time. Let's start with the first step. You just heard me making small talk with our guests before we started our taping. And usually we cut that part out of the episode, but we wanted to show it to you because we were actually finding connection within each other before we begin. And even though small talk may feel forced and uncomfortable, it is an important first step in building relationships. Another way to break the ice is the good old fashioned elevator pitch. Before we begin anything, Deeper, I want each of you to tell me how you would introduce yourself to me as if we were meeting at an event. <laughs> okay. That's the challenge. That's, and then that's, I'll do it too, and I'll do it too, I'll do it too. That's always difficult. It's always changing. It's like, how do you find the balance between not making it like look like you're overcompensating, but also getting the full grasp of what you do and so you're taking seriously, and so... For me, I think um, just the quick spiel, like, you know, 10 second introduction is Hi, I'm Gael. I am the host of a teenager therapy podcast, which is one of the largest youth mental health podcasts in the world. And recently, a couple months ago, I started Astro Studios, which is a Gen Z podcast production company. That's perfect. And then you, Eric, what, how do you introduce yourself? Yeah, I introduce myself like, hi, I'm, I'm Eric Rodriguez. I'm a global keynote speaker, and I speak on the power of embracing change and disruption. See, oh, so I'm, I'm hearing this theme of like, it's good to just have this one, like they say, like the elevator pitch, just this like one sentence thing. So I would just, I guess I would say like, hi, my name is Eleni Mata. I'm a producer at Harvard Business Review, and I like to make audio and video stuff. That's honestly what I say. <laughs> that's, that's, I mean, that's what it is. That's great. It's a great, yeah. So now you've met our guests, who, by the way, I met through networking. More on that later. Gaia created his first podcast when he was in high school. Now, at 20, he's building his own production company. Eric is a former tech executive. He spent more than a decade at Intel, and now he's making a career pivot to become a public speaker. For both Gael and Eric, networking is a huge part of their work, and they've both had a lot of practice doing it. We'll hear what works for them and some of their horror stories about what has gone wrong. Plus, we'll answer your questions about getting started with networking. Okay, let's get into it. So I was listening to um, Gael's episode of like, am I horrible at making friends this morning? And even like one of your articles in Medium Gail, you were saying like network in the spirit of making friends. Yeah. But like, so what is the difference then between networking and making friends? I think it varies because some okay. people see it as one and the same. 
But we also have to acknowledge that, you know, not everything is a friendship. And there is a clear distinction between business friends and your professional circle and your actual social circle. And to call it all friendship would be doing a disservice to the actual connections that are your friends. That's the big distinction between what a friendship is, which is an intentional reach out versus, oh, it's nice to see you again at the same conference. Do you agree, Eric, like the difference between and like you approach it in that same way? networking versus like making friends? Yeah, I think one of the things that kind of shifted my mindset on, on this particular question was a few years ago, someone asked me, say, hey, Eric, who, how big is your network? And so immediately my response was, all right, let, let me check my phone. <laughs> right, so I check my phone, I either go to LinkedIn or check my contacts and I'm like, oh, this is the number. And they're like, no, like who's in your network? And I was like, I don't understand your question. <laughs> and basically <laughs> their answer was, the people that are in your network are the people you're willing to call and ask for their time in the next 24 hours and say, hey, I need 15 minutes of your time because this is happening to me. Can you give me 15 mm. minutes of your time? And they're willing to move everything for you. That is who your immediate and your most trusted network is. This is a long game. You will not have someone on your list in 24 hours that I just met yesterday and say, hey, I need your help tomorrow. No. This takes time. It takes time to build that list. And so that was a personal reflection that I had is like, who is on my list? of folks that one, I would call, but then two, who am I willing to answer that call that says, Eric, I need 15 minutes of your time tomorrow. And, and, and so also appreciating those relationships as well. And so am I taking my time in my day to day or in my week to continue to build these relationships that you never know when you might need them. It might be in a spirit of a friendship, right? Something might be happening that's more, more personal, but it might also be in the spirit of business. So I wonder how have y'all been able to start conversations like cold conversations in a setting like this or even on social if you want to like message somebody or dm somebody because i think that's a really hard it's it's a hard task to find that commonality and how do you kind of start that convo yeah that's when it becomes a lot harder to network in the way that you might want to view networking as which i think for both of us is friendship over exploitative what can we get out of each other yeah i realize when i'm networking with people young as young as me and i think it's a lot easier and natural and networking just happens you become friends you see each other you're co-working and then you think of each other when there's projects to work on mm -hmm. but now when you're approaching people significantly older than you i think what has helped me a lot is being mission driven and having a very clear mission and an impact that you want to see because I think a lot of older folks resonate with young people doing something to make an impact in the world and for me that has always been about youth mental health and helping young people feel less alone and so even though age isn't necessarily a commonality I think a lot of people subscribe to the mission and the impact and the work that I'm doing throughout it and more than anything they're willing to be mentors they're willing to help they're willing to expand my network my social circle and if they like the work lift you up what other different ways of networking have y'all been finding that are beneficial to you other than just going to an event? Well, for me, I think events are not how I prefer to network. I think I maybe I should do more of them. I think that would probably really get me into new circles. Uh, for me, networking has always been about cold DMing, actually, and warm intros and stuff like that. You know, it's it's very casual. I think it's kind of like, hey, like I love what you're doing. We're in the same circle. We have mutuals. We're in the same community spaces. We're in the same projects, whatever it might be. And then reaching out to them. And I think, especially when you, as for young people, maybe this is more relevant, when you have a lot of mutuals on Twitter, Twitter has been incredible for networking. If you have a lot of mutuals, if you reply to people's tweets often, if you interact with them, that's what I find unlocks so many doors. Because if someone that's been replying to your tweets over and over and engaging with you in meaningful conversation eventually reaches over and asks, actually DMs you, you're more likely to respond. And so stuff like that has been incredible for meeting new people. We're talking about networking as if it's like so simple, but it like it could it could still be hard, which leads to my next question. Have y'all had some networking fails where like it didn't work out the, <laughs> the way that you thought it was going to? Oh, yeah. Based on both of your faces. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I had I had I've had a couple. I had one pretty recently, actually. Um, oh, what is it? There was this person that I had been trying to meet for the longest time. 
and it was someone in my industry that has been really successful and they've just been great um, at everything they've done. And so I connected with them on LinkedIn and I asked if they would like to get on a call. Eventually they, you know, to my surprise, they responded and they, you know, added me on an email thread with their assistant. And so I, I was able to start scheduling a call. And this was like, this was maybe beginning of June and the, the call didn't get scheduled till August. Turns out that I ended up having to attend uh, this conference on the same day that I was going to have this call. But I thought, okay, it'll be okay. I could take some minutes, go to a room, find some time to take this call and it'll be fine. And so the time comes, the, the call's at 1.30 and it's like 1.28. I'm scrambling to finish lunch and like get started on this. I'm trying to find a room now. I join a random room when someone else is also on a call. And then I realize I'm opening my computer with like two minutes to set up. I realize I don't have internet. I don't have the Wi-Fi password yet. Um. And I'm like, oh my gosh, let me like set up my hotspot. And I'm trying to set up my hotspot. And now there's like a minute left. And as I'm trying to set it up, now it's like 1.30, so the call is supposed to be starting. I'm still like, my computer's just lagging. So I get on the call two minutes late at like 1.32. And I'm like, hey, I'm so sorry. Like, thank you so much for waiting for me. And then the first thing I hear is, oh, I think you're delayed. There's a pretty big delay. I hear you speaking. I see you speaking, but I don't hear you for another like five, ten seconds. And I'm like, oh, oh no, gosh. like, let me see if I can fix this. Of course, there was no fixing it. So I scramble for like a minute being like, hold on. Okay. And she's like, you know what? Like, it's fine. Let's just continue. Like, I think it's better now. I'm like, okay, great. Like, how are you? And, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like. Well, like, it, there's a big delay, so it's like small talk doesn't even work. And so there wasn't, when there's a delay, you just can't have any small talk because it's like that energy isn't there. The connection isn't going to work. So it was like, okay, well, I guess we'll just get right to it. And so I started kind of maybe asking for some help and some feedback. And long story short, the call goes on for maybe like 10, 11 minutes, connection issues throughout it. And at that point, I was also already thinking, like, you know what? At this point, I should just be like, hey, I'm so sorry. Like, it's clearly not working out. I feel bad. I feel like I'm wasting your time. And But before I could say it, she was like, okay, you know what? Let's just end the call. Like, email me with any questions. We'll, like, figure it out. And I was like, yeah, that's, <laughs> you know, I agree. I'm sorry. Like, thank you so much for being patient. Sorry it turned out like this. And they were like, it's okay. Don't worry about it. I remember thinking after this moment, like, wow, like that went terrible. I hope they don't hate me. I hope like I'm not, you know, because it's like once that happens, you're left in this weird spot of where does this connection leave us? And is it a dead connection? And so I decided to just, I was like, you know what? I'll just send a nice email, like thanking them for their time, apologizing for the connection issues. And if, if they really hated me, hated my first introduction, they don't want to respond, that's okay. But at least they'll be out there just, you know, to never burn a bridge. And I guess it does have a happy ending because they did respond very well. And they said, you know what? It was okay. Don't worry about it. Like, it happens. Just stay in touch, you know. But still not the greatest first introduction. So I'm hoping eventually I can offer maybe some value to make up for what I feel like was wasted time. Kudos to you for keeping calm, though. Yeah, it I was tough. Probably, like, cry. It, was, <laughs> it was definitely tough. But it was like, you know what? That's all you can do. Absolutely. That has happened to me several times, especially when you're speaking with someone that is a industry leader or a senior executive or what have you. What I try to do, I give them a heads up on who I am, because more than likely, you know more about that person than they know about you. And if they're just giving you 15 minutes, 30 minutes of their time, you want to get like straight to the point of like, what do you need from them to a certain extent, right? Because that's authentically mm. why y'all are connecting in, in these type of situations, right? I say, hey, you know, fine, God, I'll give you. 10 minutes of my time, 15 minutes of my time, because you seem to be an up and coming, I'll give it to you, right? But if you spend the first 10 minutes just catching up on kind of the state of your business, the last five minutes is the ask, and you don't have an opportunity to go in depth. And so what I try to do is I try to just create like a one pager and just send that to them a little bit on my background. The likelihood of them reading that is very low, <laughs> but the likelihood of them skimming through it two minutes before your meeting is actually very high because they want to be helpful. Yeah. Again, they, they don't want to meet with you just for the sake of meeting. They want to be of service. And so if you take it from that spirit, prepare them, give them, equip them 
from the beer service to you. So that's my quick yeah. uh, tip on that. That's a great tip yeah. because I think that's another thing about networking that I have to learn to get comfortable with is understanding that, like I said earlier, it's not just a friendship that you're just catching up. It really is an ask and you both have to be comfortable with that. And that's been something that's been tough to navigate because with these people that are obviously much more senior, yes, I'm connecting with, with them to learn from them. And I think... I have to switch my approach from thinking like, oh, maybe let's catch up for a bit, learn about each other. Like, what's your life like? What's my life? It's like, no, like they're giving me time, even if it feels a little unnatural to just be like, okay, here's what I want to learn from you. I'm really like, I need to know about this and this. Like, that's what they're there for. And that's just a different dynamic that you don't do in your day to day life, which is kind of like a shocker for younger professionals like are finally entering networking and searching for people that can help them. Yeah. Wait. So, Eric, what was the lineup of the one pager? Break it down? Sure. I mean, I just have a one page. I mean, some people could be like one PowerPoint slide. So it just has, you know, who I am, a picture of myself, um, what I'm working on, what my mission is, maybe some of my biggest accomplishments, again, related to the person you're talking to. So it's not just like a, a one document that you send to the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's a template, but then you kind of work through it, right? Depending on who you're talking with. And then the final thing, which is in big bold, is like what I am looking for. And so like that could be, I'm looking for a mentor in the spaces of XYZ, or I'm looking for a sponsorship in this one, or I'm looking to collaborate on this idea that I have, or I'm looking to connect with someone in this industry because of XYZ. Like if you're able to be that specific with that and then connect that to what your brand is, I think that's a great start. I like that. But I'm going to I'm going to pin yes. you because you haven't you shared your network fail. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So so a network fail and a very common fail that I... I have is, is I struggle with with names. And if you ask anyone, it's like, what is the most beautiful sound that anyone would ever hear in their life? It's their name. And so you need to respect that, right? And honor that. And so when I get introduced to individuals, I try to make sure I repeat their name. So that's one of the, the tricks that I have. But I have been, I've been in situations where people recognize me because either they saw me at a conference or they see me somewhere else. I say, hey, Eric, how's it going? And I'm like, hi <laughs> like like if, <laughs> and they know me and they, they know what i've been talking about so i'm like did i meet you somewhere else did i did you just see me on stage is this just a random like did you see a badge like like how do you know me right and all this stuff is going through my head and so i've had these opportunities to say hey you know what I, i'm sorry can you remind me again of your name and that's completely okay but the other trick that i built was when you're with someone else like say if i was with gael and we we're having this conversation and someone else approaches me and they say Hey, Eric, man, great to see you again. How are things going? And I forgot their name. The first thing I do is I introduce him to a guy. And I'm like, hey, mm. let me introduce you to my friend, Gael. Gael. And, then, and then they immediately automatically will probably say, hi, my name is. Oh, hey, Gael, my right? name is. And then is... I'm like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> like, immediately just clicks. I'm like, I now remember you. Coming up after the break, we answer your networking questions. And we'll learn some ways to keep these relationships lasting over time. Be right back. Okay, we're back. Let's get into some questions about networking that we've collected from listeners and our HBR interns. So here's the first question. It's from one of our former interns, Beatrice. Let's say you want to work in an industry. If you like search up on LinkedIn, there's so many different people who work in that industry. How do you know who to connect with? Personally, I want to work in the film industry. There's like so many different people, but like who who should I go to? For me, it becomes, again, using Twitter. I think figuring out first, following the brands and then seeing who are the people commenting on this, who are the people retweeting this. So you go down this rabbit hole of mutuals on mutuals on mutuals. The challenge is finding the people. And again, that just kind of comes with finding the super connectors in the industry and also the ones that are just active on social media. Yeah. Do you agree, Eric? Do you have anything like to add to that? Yes, I love that 100%. Everything that got shared. Uh, the one thing I would add is that every three months, there's a quarterly earnings call. <laughs> every three months, this company shares everything that they're working on, everything that's working out great, everything that's not working out great, and what their plans are for their year. That is a great opportunity for you to learn about the industry. And then when you reach out to these individuals, say, hey, I just heard these things that they were talking about in your last earnings call. Can you share with me a little bit more? Or, hey, this sounds like a really exciting project. Would love to connect with you so I could learn a little bit more. Okay, next question. This is from one of our listeners, Anna. 
She sent her question through text, and she says, how can you network authentically? I'm an introvert, and I often think that networking is a forced activity for me. I mean, if you really want to approach it in, in you know, a very casual way, you could compliment their outfit, you could compliment something nice about them. Maybe you notice their, the way they're interacting with people. I think a great first way to start it off in a way that feels organic is a good compliment. And I think that kind of sparks a conversation that, you know, could, could feel a lot better than just, hey, what do you do? What's your name? For me, it would be, again, maybe in the spirit of the event. And, and saying, hey, what brought you here? Or just sharing, hey, I'm excited to do this here. And sometimes even just being as vulnerable as well, saying, hey, I understand that we're here, but why are you here? Like, I might not be that comfortable being here. You never know who you meet, too. That might say, you know what? I know exactly what you're going through. I'm going through the same thing. And, and hopefully, I mean, that goes into something else that's a little bit more productive <laughs> than just complaining. But, but you never know when also just being vulnerable could also spark some, some additional conversations as well. Okay, and last one, we have a question from another one of our interns, Diego. I'm from Mexico, and in Mexico, like, networking is not as enforced as it is here. Eventually, people who graduate, they might find a job because, oh, you know somebody in the company, and then he helped you out or whatever. And here, from my experience in college, networking ha is very forced upon. It's like you have this campus recruiting, and you have to go and meet all the people that are recruiting at, at your school. It's not like deep relationships. So how do you account for cultural differences and how networking works? How would you answer that question? I think in Mexico, there's a bigger sense of almost like a family, an inherent family bond. Because sometimes I, I, I'll, I'll be watching podcast interviews where the host is interviewing a really big A-list celebrity in Mexico But they really just talk like if they were good friends. And like there, there's that sense of familiarity um, with each other and like that, that bond. And so I think there's a cultural difference there. I think maybe you notice it when you connect with other Latinos and there's that sense of like, oh, like it feels like we're already friends. Like we're already on good mm -hmm. terms just because of that. So how do you account for like these cultural differences? Not just like accounting for, let's say, like other Latinos in the room, but like if you're trying to communicate with or trying to market yourself and you're in like in a multicultural room, like how do you do that? When it comes to multicultural aspects of things, you don't know what you don't know, but be open to learning. And so if there's different customs around different communities or different cultures, especially the university, you're surrounded by people with completely different backgrounds and completely different upbringings. But even though y'all all in that same school or getting that same degree, at the end of the day, we're all still very unique. And so embracing that uniqueness, recognizing that uniqueness in each other, but in the spirit of learning. How have you been able to replenish your social battery when it comes to networking so you can like keep doing it? You know, I personally am still in the process of figuring that out. It seems like I am terrible at maintaining my close network and upkeeping it and adding new people. It's difficult. I mean, it's even more difficult when you're not in the same vicinity and you're not in the same city. And a thousand times more difficult when you're not co-workers and you're mm. on a project by project basis. And for me, a lot of my projects is I've never been part of a team. I've never had a traditional job in the sense of I have my team. Here are my mentors. Here's my, my, my teammates. Here's who I'm going to work with for the next couple of months. That really builds that foundation for a strong network once you move on towards a new job. And so for me, it's been really difficult to understand how to find excuses to stay in touch and build connections with people that are deeper than just a one-off project or, or a one-off call. Eric, I think you're really good at maintaining these relationships. And I think you've just had so much practice of maintaining. Like, what advice would you give to Gael? Yeah, so, so it's a couple of things, right? Is one, checking in with each other. When you have a chance to be in, in the professional space for, for some time, there's going to be some wonderful moments and there's going to be some horrible moments in, in industry. What I mean by that is we're going through the tech layoffs for the last 18 months. I've mm -hmm. known a lot of individuals that have gone through layoffs. I've been through layoffs myself. And so checking in with folks that sometimes they don't want to share publicly that they're going through this, just check in and you'll be surprised Taking the opportunity to check in with someone, it means a lot. Eric, how have you been seeing people around the age of like Gael's trying to network with you? And how has that been going? Yeah, I always think back to Elaine. I mean, you and I, how we got introduced. And I was reflecting on that. 
that introduction actually started off in 2017 when I met someone that ended up being our common friend. Oh. And then it was through that relationship we started making meaningful connection and, and collaborating. And then I eventually was introduced to you. Wow. And so you never know how these introductions, these connections come in. But if you come in just in the spirit of service and support and helping elevate others and, and the work that they're doing, you will always find that path eventually to collaborate either directly with them or someone within their network. This has been awesome. I hope... I can talk to both of you in a separate setting just to continue keeping up in the spirit of making friends and see where that blooms. So I appreciate the both of you so much. Thank you so Muchísima much. Muchísimas gracias. Yes, thank you so thank much. You. It was amazing. <laughs> okay, I want to point out one thing before we go. This episode isn't just about networking. It actually only came about because of networking. I met Gael through my colleague Ian here at HBR. And Ian knew Gael because Gael had reached out to him to talk about podcasting. And I met our other guest, Eric Rodriguez, because a mutual friend connected the two of us a few months ago. Eric suggested that we set up monthly meetings. We're both pretty busy now, so they're only about 15 to 30 minutes. But it's enough to keep us both accountable and it naturally helps our relationship keep growing over time. Next week, we'll be talking about messing up at work and how you can recover. You know, like using the wrong slides for a presentation, maybe hitting reply all and accidentally spamming your whole company, to bigger mistakes that harm your credibility and even threaten your job. I've done that once. I've presented the wrong slides. Twice! <laughs> Thanks again to our guests Gael Ayetor and Eric Rodriguez and our interns Beatrice Gautier and Diego Ortega. By the way, if you're curious to see a sample of Eric's one-pager for networking, we've posted that link in our show notes. To our listeners who shared their networking questions, thank you. Please keep sending us your stories and questions about work. Bonus points if it's an audio file. We might even use it in an episode. Our email is newhere at hbr.org. If you liked what you heard, follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. While you're there, leave us a review and tell us what you think of the show. Then send the episode to your group chat, Slack, or wherever you talk about work. Did you know the Harvard Business Review has more podcasts to help you manage your business and your career? Find them at hbr.org slash podcasts or search HBR wherever you listen. This episode was produced by Hannah Bates, Ann Sani, Madeline Johnson, and me, Eleni Mata. Special thanks to Kurt Nickish and Rob Eckhart. Our editor is Mary Dew and our engineer is Tina Toby Mack. Supervising editors are Maureen Hoke and Paige Cohen. Ian Fox manages podcasts at HBR. And our theme song was composed by Graz de Oliveira. See you here next week. Bye.